everyone. I am so excited to have on a friend on this program who is an incredible woman. She loves the Lord. She's got an amazing outreach. She's got something called the Discovery House in Las Vegas. She has an incredible background. You would never think that someone with her background would be so on fire for Jesus. Annie LaBert is a former call girl and sex industry worker who founded the International Christian Ministry, Hookers for Jesus, which, by the way, many religious people are upset about, but I think that is an incredible name. Glory to God. Lobert worked as a prostitute in Las Vegas, in Minneapolis, and Hawaii for 16 years. That's a long time. She left the sex industry because of one of her clients who fell in love with her. In 2010, she produced and starred in a three-part documentary series called Hookers Saved on the Strip, which was broadcast on cable TV's Investigation Discovery. I know a little bit about reality television, so her and I have a little bit in common there. But without further ado, Annie, it is so good to have you on the program today. In live for you right now, okay? I love doing this type of stuff. I just really feel you have a media anointing, and I just need to say that. And I know you do because the media chased you, right? Yeah. And you got on Survivor. So I just, you know, it's really cool because that's what happened to us as well. Uh, even though I wasn't on Survivor, you know, my husband wouldn't let me go. So, <laughs> but well, yeah, thank you so much for having me on today. Oh, I'm so honored that you're here. When we met back, back a few weekends ago at Mary Crowley's event, Women Arise, it was mm. so prophetic. And I know that you are prophetic. And you were flow with the Holy Ghost after the conference and prophesying over everyone. And, you know, many people would look at you and say, oh, there's no way she likes Jesus. She's got pink hair. She's got a pink scarf. You know, listen, the Lord said that men judge on the outside, on the appearance, but God looks at the heart. And two minutes of talking to Annie, you'll know how beautiful she is, not just on the outside, but on the inside. So tell me about your past and, and, and your and your testimony, because you have one of the most incredible testimonies I've ever heard. And on the one side, it's dark, but on the other side, there's such light. And it says in the word of God, those who have been forgiven much, love much. And I can mm. attest to that, too, where I felt like Mary Magdalene a few times in my life as well. You know, right. Annie, I almost went into, um, I remember, and this is something I've never shared before. When I was in college and needed some extra money. You know, the enemy was telling me, you should do escort. You should you look on the escort app. And I looked at it and thank God the Lord protected me from not going further because I remember thinking, wow. well, I remember thinking, well, I mean, there's no problem with going on a date with someone, you know, being their mm -hmm. arm candy, being paid 500 bucks, but I would never sleep with them. Right. But I found out later that that's just a ruse to get you into the industry because eventually you do sell yourself. So I'm grateful the Lord protected me, but you have that kind of story where you kind of got wrapped up. So why don't you tell us, how did you get into prostitution? How did that happen? It's so crazy that you're asking that question because honestly, I when I look back now, I can't believe I used to do that. And and honestly, the other thing is I had I even had a dream last night that I was still working. Sometimes I get pulled back into my past and in, in my dreams, but God always like centers me back by the time that I wake up or during the dream. But what happened is for me as a young little girl, I never felt that I was cared for and loved by my father. And so that can really, really destroy a little girl's heart. My dad was hitting my mom in front of us kids. He was in the air force. He got kicked out because he was drinking. So we moved around seven times as I was growing up, seven different schools. I was very shy. And the other thing is, is that even though my dad, like he was a provider and he took care of us, I don't like to throw him under the bus, but my dad, he was a Christian because he passed away about five years ago, but he always wanted for us kids to do well. And even though he was very abusive and he was, you know, he, he was narcissistic, he gaslighted my mom a lot and us kids, it was like, I still loved him, Anna. I loved him. And if I can talk to anyone out there that has lost hope for your parent and has lost like the feeling of honoring them, 
there is a possibility that your anger is so strong and your unforgiveness and bitterness that you just can't get past that. But for me, as my dad was abusive, and, I, and I'm going to get teary-eyed thinking about it, um, I kept forgiving him. But I know that there was some part of me that was like this rebellious teen that I was just like, I need to make something of myself. Because yes, I forgive my dad deep down inside for the way that he was with us. I wanted to prove something to him and my mom and people that I knew growing up because I never felt like I mattered. I never felt like I had a purpose and I never felt seen. Does that make sense? Oh, and it makes it, total sense. Girl, mm -hmm. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I feel like the Holy Spirit's here right now. And maybe, just maybe, you know, that's why I love color so much because I am living color for Jesus, you know, Hallelujah. because I know that God is a God of color, right? And creativity and artistry and perfection. And he makes us into these masterpieces. And even as little girls, when we don't feel loved, like, in our human being sense and our human state, our heart is empty and it's crying out for the love of a father. And so that's what I did as I grew up. I like searched and I noticed boys were looking at me. So I got hit on at school. I felt like, wow, I feel like I'm being paid attention to. This is great. You know, I always got along with women. I never had a problem with my girlfriends. Like we always would hang and stuff and go to parties, but I got date raped more, more times than I could count. And I found out that the world is a cruel place if you're desperate for love, right? It's a cruel place. And it's a cruel place regardless if you don't have God in your life. And I was raised as a Christian. I remember I actually got saved on television. This is so crazy. Billy wow. Graham. I, I went to Sunday school, said the prayer, but I literally really felt the Holy Spirit when I was very little, probably four or five. My dad made us watch the Billy Graham crusade. And he was in this big stadium and Johnny Cash was there and he was singing and it was just like all these thousands of people. If you've ever seen the Crusades ever, like a repeat on YouTube somewhere or just I watching know. him preach. Yeah, powerful. he was powerful, powerful. He kept it 100. He did not, he did not like try to soft coat anything about God and who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. And he, when he did those altar calls, it was like the juggler vein of your soul got touched and you were like, oh my gosh, I have to go down to the altar. I have to be forgiven for my sins. And, and so that's what I did. Like I literally laid there on the floor and I cried because I knew that I needed Jesus. And, mm. but the thing is, is that as a little girl, you know, I went to parochial school for about two years when I was eight, nine years old, I was being sexually abused by a neighbor across the street. So it, that really jaded me a lot. But it also made me hold this guilt inside of myself thinking it was my fault. I made that person do that to me because of who I was and how I looked and everything. And, you know, the enemy will come in as that thief and steal, kill and destroy. And he'll duplicate himself. And also he'll he'll mask as this being of light, you know. And so to me, when I met the first guy in school that I thought loved me, he was like my being of light. Like I trusted him. And when I gave my heart to him. I mean, I literally was so devastated when I found out he was cheating on me. So I went back out into the world after I left high school, just totally embittered, but really sassy pants. Like I was literally like this rebellious, like I'm going to go out into the world and I'm going to make things happen. I'm going to become a corporate businesswoman. I'm going to own my own business. I'm going to work for some big company first and I'm going to learn how they did it. And I'm going to become very wealthy. And I'm going to get all the designer clothes that I never got growing up. I'm going to get a beautiful car and a beautiful house. And I'm going to marry some guy. And we're going to have kids. And we're going to travel the world. This was my thought. you know. And I actually told myself, I'm going to live in Paris one day. Paris, France. Because my name's Lobert. So I'm, you know, I got French in my blood. So I'm going to go back to the roots of where my family comes from. And I'm going to go live in Paris. And I'm just going to be this French girl, you know. Like, and so, you know, us as children, we have these fantasy and then when reality hits, we're like, dang, that was not what happened. Like, so I thought to myself, this is what's going to happen. My life's going to go like this. And that is not what happened. I went out to a nightclub one night with my girlfriend. I had three jobs. 
and we saw these guys and they came in and they looked very wealthy. They looked very like debonair and they had the Rolex watches on. And I had never seen a real Rolex watch in person. I was like, wow, that's really beautiful. And they were dressed to the nines, fur coats on. I know people are like, well, you should have known they were traffickers. They had fur coats on Annie. Back in the 80s, okay, I'm dating myself, of course. That wasn't really a bad, bad, bad thing to have a fur coat. Like we all know of, of organizations that throw paint on people and that they down real furs. We can't kill animals. And while I don't disagree or agree with that, because I'm kind of neutral on that, because I come from a family that we hunted growing up. Sure. Like we lived off venison and, you know, game. Like my dad taught my brothers how to hunt. We had guns. We had rifles, shotguns, all that. I never killed anything, by the way. And I only went hunting to observe and I didn't like it. And I'm being honest, I would never kill an animal. So mm -hmm. we talked to these guys. I'm going off, off uh, topic, but let's get back to the club. I was at the club. It was called Marshall's. It is now a strip club called Choices in Minneapolis. Where women are being trafficked upstairs, by the way, on the second floor. Okay. So. I'm in this club and these guys start talking to us and my girlfriend starts talking to one of the guys. The other guy was like, they both to me were not even handsome. I was like, ew, like I'm so superficial when it came to looks back then. I like needed to have a guy that was drop dead gorgeous, like had to be fine, cute, whatever, handsome. And my girlfriend starts really connecting with him. And all of a sudden, like, uh, you know, after she exchanged her number with him, She's like calling me up going, girl, let's go out to the club. I'm driving in a Benz. And I'm like, how did you get the Benz? Like her and I both didn't have a lot of money. Like we, I was working three jobs, Anna, three jobs at 18 years old. Okay. Go get her. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any totally. hour that it wasn't working was an hour wasted. I thought I yeah. have to be making money. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Make it happen. Grind, Super. hustle, whatever. And mm -hmm. so th those hours being off work and being like burned out was their hours to go to the clubs. And then I slept four hours and then I'd get up and re repeat the day every day, four or five hours sleep, get up. I mean, when you're a teenager, yeah. you can do that kind of stuff. You can. You don't get, get exhausted very easily. And I loved coffee back then. I would just tank coffee. I mean, whatever I could have, get on my hands. I didn't do drugs back then. I was like, I drank, you know, dr you know, alcohol on the weekends. But so she ends up going to Hawaii and this guy like had his best friend's girl, which is another pimp, turn her out. And what I mean by that is it's when someone learns how to sell themselves into sexual exploitation. Right. And we can say prostitute, prostitution. Prostitution is by many opinions and words now of people that it's a choice that we got into this industry, that it's our choice to sell ourselves. But to be honest with you, my girlfriend didn't have her father in her life. And with me, we were a lot alike. We had like an orphan spirit. So we both were like rebellious against our fathers. Right. And she honestly didn't have a lot of nice things and she wanted nice things just like me. Her and I both had the same thought process. Let's make some money. And she tells me, Hey, I'm in Hawaii come to Hawaii. I got a ticket for you. It's 500 bucks, but we're going to cover it. Just fly here. I had never been to California. I had, I'm from Minnesota, right? I had never been to Hawaii and I'd never seen the ocean only on television. Okay. So the biggest body of water I had ever seen was Lake Superior, which you can't see the end of it because it's a lot like the ocean, but it's not. So I was so excited. I'm like, I'm going to Hawaii. I'm like, wee! I get on the plane and I'm looking through the windows and I see it approach us approaching the islands. And I was just like, whoa, oh my gosh, it's so green and the beaches and we land. And the first night that I worked, I sold myself to some Japanese men with my girlfriend and we walked on the street. We met them in Waikiki Beach. They couldn't speak English. So I had to learn how to solicit and solicit obviously is to propose something to someone and offer them a service to get paid. Right. So I said, which means, would you like to come with me and have fun and play with me? And that in, ja in Japanese, that's basically very sexual to them. You can't say that without propositioning someone for sex. 
And so that's what I did that night. And to me, it was like, I wasn't ashamed. It, it, it was dark, but it was like, I felt empowered. Just being real. I felt empowered. Like, oh, these guys are Marks. These guys are Johns. These guys are fools. Like they're tricks. They gave us their money, 500 bucks each. You know, you, you just take your clothes off and you don't even have to touch anything like, or, or anyone like, cause that's how quick it was, Anna. It was like, I turned a trick without turning a trick because this man that I was with couldn't control himself. If you get what I'm saying without saying it. Right. And I was like, this is too easy. Like, how does someone not do this? Like, this is like, I just hit a gold mine. Easy money. Yeah. You have easy $500. Money. Yeah. $500 with no pimp, no escort service. You don't have to pay anybody. In the 80s, double it. So it was a thousand bucks to take my clothes off for five minutes and walk out the room and put my clothes back on. I was like, dude, I'm making three dollars and forty seven cents an hour. This is way too easy. So I ended up working the next two weeks of my vacation because I took vacation from my jobs from in, in Minnesota and I didn't have a pimp. Flew back. I, I told my girl at my supervisor, Judy Leone, I quit. I'm done. I'm not going to work this job anymore. I found a better job. And I signed up with the escort services. Well, guess what happens to me in Minnesota? If no one understands what an escort service is, an escort service is a place that you can call or an ad that you can call that sends out women of your choosing from a list of your features that you like, right? And a woman or a man can order that person. And you look at pictures and you pick the person and you say, I want her. And so I was advertised as a busty, Barely 18 blonde, because honestly, here's the thing. I did not look my age. Wow. A lot of people, when I would talk and meet with them, they would be like, how old are you? About 16. I'm like, uh, no, I'm 18. How dare you insult me? Like, mm -hmm. because I have this little baby face, like oh. I'm in my fifties. So yeah. you look at my, imagine what, I, just imagine what I look like when I was a teenager, like innocent and cute and like oh. flawless skin, whatever, you know, collagen for days. <laughs> and you know, the, you on four hours of sleep, baby face. Right. Off four hours of sleep. So, so unfortunately we have an appetite for sex for sale in all of our world. And the demand is there for underage girls. Okay. Girls that are innocent. Girls that haven't experienced hardly anything because see, I believe with the, with the men that do this, they want control. It's a thrill. It's exciting for them and they could possibly get in trouble. So that turns them on even more. And mm -hmm. as sick as that sounds, that was the appeal that the ad that they put out for me. And, and I ended up almost getting cut by a machete. I had a buyer that called that he pulled out this long hunting knife with the rid ridges on it. And he said, I'm going to have you do whatever I want. And I just was like, okay. So I got raped. And then I had a guy pull out a shotgun trip out of me and tell me that he was going to be my husband and he, I was going to live with him now. And I talked him out of like shooting me. Like I begged him for my life. He let me go, believe it or not. And then I, after that happened, I was like, okay, I'm done. I am not going to work these escort services anymore. I couldn't believe that this could happen to someone like me. And I started working at the strip clubs and listen, it's just the same thing, different Avenue, right? Easy the money. Same transactions are going on. Hmm. And let me tell you the, per, the people that own that escort services, their names, I'm just going to say it were Bruce and Maggie. I didn't know they were traffickers. I mean, they took like a percentage of my money and I was, they were making a lot of money off of me and I didn't realize what was going on, but I kept my own little tips that I got. And so when I started working for the, uh, the actual strip clubs, that's when I met my real trafficker. And so again, I want to emphasize to everyone, just because we have chosen the sex industry as a job choice, doesn't mean you don't get exploited. Okay. Because sometimes poverty will have you choose that lifestyle. Sometimes desperation will have you choose that lifestyle. And sometimes because you don't know any better and you just feel empty, it's exciting, it's new. Maybe you're gonna meet your prince, maybe even Richard Gere, right, from Pretty Woman. 
right? Exactly. And you're going to meet a guy that has money that absolutely loves you. That was my ultimate goal, by the way. I'm going to meet a millionaire or a billionaire, and I'm going to figure out how to get what I want done in my life, which, by the way, wasn't just to become wealthy and have my own company. I wanted to become my, the, an artist. I like to draw and paint, which I don't hardly do anymore. And I loved music. And I was actually in the music scene. I don't want to go in heavy detail, but my book, yes. Fallen Out of the Sex Industry and Into the Arms of Savior, this was my working name, Fallen York. This has a lot of the details we're sharing right now, but more in here. This is about a six hour read. So yeah, you guys have to get it. I have a copy and I, I just started reading it because we just met and it's amazing. It goes through all yeah. of the backstory with more yeah. detail. It's, 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 it, it actually was probably about 500 pages, but my editor said 223 any that's your cutoff. I'm like, Oh, I have to get rid of everything now. Like this is the bulk of my story. But anyway, so we'll just fast forward to the, the moment I got trafficked was I brought my boyfriend from the strip club I met and he was a drug dealer and I didn't like it. I brought him to Las Vegas with me because my girlfriend that was in Hawaii, her pimp had houses like Minnesota, Baltimore, Hawaii. I think he had one in California. And I, I, I just can't remember all the, all the places he had houses, but Minneapolis as well. And he was what they call a circuit pimp. So she you know, had a house in Vegas with him. And she said, come stay with us. Annie, the money here is so good. You're going to trip out. Like when you find out how much you can make here, it is like phenomenal. And I was like, I'm coming to Vegas. So I brought him with me, left my apartment there. And the first night that I worked, I made some money on a couple calls and I came back and I, I was wearing all white and I looked so cute that night. Like my hair was curled and I got into the house and I put my beautiful white purse on the table on the, they had a bar there, like when, you know, one of those self-serving bars and my girlfriend, she had no idea that this guy was going to do this to me. She's like, Fallon made money. And I was like, yeah. And, and next thing I know, my pimp saying to me, break yourself. Now this is the thing with the pimps too. They have to represent each other and themselves in front of each other. They have to show game and show their strength. So he had to serve me. That's what they call serving and break me in front of this other pimp. Now I didn't know it, but they probably talked before and said, Hey, I'm about to break down Fallon so that she's totally subservient to me and she's going to get with me. Right. And I didn't have any idea this was going on. So as soon as he said, break yourself and his eyes got like really big and he started looking like a monster he took my head and started banging it on the the kitchen counters and inside the, the drawers of the counters and then dragged me outside into the back of the house and started beating me profusely, screaming at me, I'm your pimp, B. You can fill in the blanks because we're trying to be good here and not swear. Every swear word, every name in the book I was called. And I couldn't catch my breath, Anna. I was like going, stop. So I, I, my eyes, like blood, like blood in my nose, down my throat, my ears were bleed. Like oh it was insane. Like I couldn't see. Oh I, I was so shocked that he was hitting me and kicking me, shoving my face in dog feces. And I just laid there just devastated. And he put me in the back room. My girlfriend was locked in her room by her pimp. And Cause she was going to call the police. She was like, I'm calling the cops. Cause she had no idea what was about to happen. And so that's called out of pocket in the game. And so he brought me Neosporin and, or band-aids and whatever else my skin got cut and had the nerve to come in there about an hour later. And I'm just crying and I want to call somebody, but I couldn't cause I didn't have access to a phone. And I had back then a pager and I didn't have my own cell phone yet. Cell phones back then were about this big. We didn't have smartphones. It was, it was probably 1987 ish, you know, 88 ish. And mm -hmm. I ended up just staying there stuck. And so the next five years, you guys are going to have to get the book. I was with this one pimp. And every time I got out of line, he would beat me down to where I was unrecognizable. Like I, Oh, 
I woke up the other day, Anna, and my arm kept going numb probably three nights in a row now. And I realized, why is my arm going numb? Then I was Googling stuff online. You know, my arm was dislocated by one of my pimps and completely taken out of the socket. And one of the injuries that happens later in your life as you get older from an arm dislocation without an operation, right, is your nerves start really getting pinched as your bone starts degenerating and you start getting uh, severe problems with your arm falling asleep and your hand going numb. So that's what's happening to me now. You know, these are lifelong injuries um, that you, that honestly, anyone considering going into the sex industry, I want to implore you, and so does Anna today, please do not call that number. Please do not step in this dark door. Because, and I'm going to get teary eyed again, because once you get in, it's like blood in, blood out. There is no getting out without severe punishment or death. The traffickers do not care about your physical body, your heart, or your soul. They do not care. What they care about is their bottom line, money. And if you're not producing money, you are no value to them. And by the way, you can be replaced in two seconds. Mm, and it says in the Bible that the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. Yes. We do need money to pay our bills and this and that, but it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. So how did you get out? And 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 when did the encounter with Jesus come? Because you're in the world, right? You're backslidden because you received Jesus when you were younger. How, what was the encounter with Jesus? Was that before or after you got out? Girl, listen, I love this part. So I want to tell you the story about that because the, the wailing wall experience that you had, <laughs> girl, I was in Italy and I was with one of my traffickers. He was there for a traveling show. He was a dancer in one of our very famous shows on the strip. He, I'll just say it. He was in the splash show from the Riviera. Uh, this is the first time I'm ever saying this and disclosing this. He was in the splash show and we went to Italy for three months to live and to travel with this traveling show. and. I brought my Bible. I brought, I had a Gideon Bible that someone gave me when I was 18, when I, when I first started uh, prostituting and before I had my first pimp and I read the new Testament for the very first time. And I remember reading it in my cabin in our trailer that we lived in. And I would cry because Anna, it said that Jesus loved me in that Bible. And the woman in adultery, I read her story and I just cried because I thought she was me and the woman at the well. And I was just like, um, God, <laughs> do you see me? Cause I'm really a bad sinner right now. Like I am really, you need to help me. And I remember praying to him. Just my prayer was so simple. It was God, just help me. Jesus, please forgive me. Help me get out of this industry. And I literally felt like the Holy Spirit came into that space for all the days I was reading the Bible. Like I had like this hope inside my heart. And I knew when I got back home to Las Vegas that I would still have to work at the escort service, that I would still have to give my money and help the guy that I was with, the pimp I was with, right? The trafficker I was living with. And so that was actually in 1994 before I came down with Hodgkin's lymphoma. But the day, that I actually surrendered everything that I had on the line. My life, everything was August 2nd, 2003, when I overdosed on cocaine. Because a lot of people are like, well, you know, you could do this sober if you wanted to. Well, the first 10 years I did. But let me tell you something. After being with so many different men and men beating me up, raping me, the pimps beating me up, controlling me, taking my every dollar that I made, me barely getting by with my own like cheap clothes because I didn't even, I had my designer clothes, but when you leave a pimp, you leave with nothing. So I'd have to start all over again. Um, it was like such a breakdown of your soul and your heart and your spirit that for you to even do this again and function, you have to get high. Like, and I wouldn't even say consider it high. I would literally just want to be okay. 
and I didn't want to feel the the anxiety, the fight, flight, or freeze. I was in constant high cortisol, adrenal rush zone because I was always on the edge of someone discovering where I was and I was about to get beat down. So like I said, blood in and blood out. This is literally like the mafia and you can die. In fact, the stats say the first seven years, the longest time a woman that's been sold can live at about an average of seven years and then she dies. Wow. You die young. It's the most dangerous job. I don't even want to call it a job. It's the most dangerous paid rape in the world, okay, mm -hmm. is prostitution, a.k.a. sex trafficking, because it's just all sex trafficking to me personally. So, all my friends had pimps, all of them. So so talk about that. I want you to talk about trafficking because how, because people wonder, well, how does prostitution lead to trafficking and how does that whole thing work? So it it's... It's pretty like simple. It's kind of like math in a way where, okay, so you have a transaction happening. Somebody is a middleman somewhere. Unless you're placing your own ads and you're actually, you know, walking, they call it walking the carpet and you have nobody watching out for you. No bodyguard, no middleman. You don't have anyone getting you calls because in, in, in prostitution, in you know, I, I'm not calling saying legalized, but in Las Vegas, the, the prostitution was done and still is, by the way, the yellow pages, there's ads for escorts and you have to pay them. And that costs a lot of money. So if you're selling yourself and the yellow pages is doing an advertisement for you. And by the way, we don't yellow pages, people hardly use those, but they still have them in the, in the casinos. Okay. In the hotel rooms with the Bible, <laughs> crazy as that sounds, right? I know. So they're getting a cut off of that. So I worked for all the escort services. Not only were the escort services making money, the phone girls get their money, the booking agents get their money, and then you get your tip and your tip goes completely to your trafficker. So if you want to get calls and the escort services, the way it used to work for us is the girls that had pimps got the most calls. You want to know why? Because we were the most reliable. They knew we needed to make our quota. And so you can start off in the sex industry independently, but eventually you go into this lonely space where you feel so unsupported. There has to be someone in your life that cares about you. So you end up meeting someone. And then if the person you think really loves you, you tell them about your profession and they either accept you or they dump you. And most men that I was meeting in my life, they accepted me. And then all of a sudden they're living off of you. That's sex trafficking. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like with my case, my boyfriend that accepted my job in Minnesota as a stripper, right? He became my trafficker. So you eventually would come to a crossroads in the sex industry where people are making money off of you. And if you stop making their money, they get very angry. Okay. If I didn't work, listen to this. If I didn't work the escort services and I called in and said, I don't feel like working tonight. I got fined. Guess how much this was in the eighties and nineties. 500,000. Nope. $1,500. If I refuse to call on. Oh my word. Okay. So you're, so, I mean, this is sex slavery is really what it is. And I would have to pay every time, Anna, every time I made my drops, let's say I would make five drops at a time, five calls I'd go on, I'd get a 250 for the agency fee and the, and the phone girl's tip or 150 depending on who they quoted on the call. And then I would, my, out of my own money, would tip ab above and beyond that. My tip was separate from their fee, but they needed their fees. Now, I had those fines, but when I left my other agency, when I finally got out of the industry, I owed them... I believe it was like $65,000 in fines. Oh my. And I would pay about 50, 25 to 50 a call. I would drop to pay towards the fines because I didn't call on mm. because I didn't feel good or I was sick or I was sick with my cancer. I would get fined. Now, not every phone girl did that. Okay. But a lot of phone girls would fine us because the owner said, you need to get that money. Uh, we're missing money. Fallon's not on tonight. She's our top. I was the top blonde at the escort agency. It was the number one escort agency in Las Vegas. So I got the best calls. Wow. And I tipped the best. And I was being trafficked the entire time. And I don't care what anyone says. Well, you know, you could have left that pimp and you could have stopped. And no, you can't. 
you know, the pimps, they isolate you. It's a lot of brainwashing going on. They isolate you. They brainwash you. They manipulate you. They control you. They force you. They threaten you. They, oh, this was one of his best tactics. They refuse to show you affection when you're not in their good graces. And that devastated me. I needed him to love me. I needed him to hug me. I needed him to show me he cared for me. And when I didn't get that, I would try harder, Anna. I would work harder to wow. get his affection. I would try to make more money. I was totally brainwashed. And when I look back now, and I see what's going on with that country, by the way, it's a sort of a brainwashing going on. Mm -hmm. Major. And they use the same tactics, the biggest one, the best one that the Nazis used. We all know what that was, right? Fear. The Nuremberg trials. They asked the Nazis in court, hey, how did you get the people to obey? Oh, that's simple, judge. Fear. We used fear. And anytime you use fear in an equation of any relationship, you completely can control that person. Exactly. Fear and the lack of love. You see, yep. you know, I, I realized this later on in my life where, um, you know, my, my father divorced my mom when I was 13 and I really needed my dad at the time. So having also hit puberty, I realized my dad didn't really show me much affection. And this is what I always say to fathers, hug your daughters, love your daughters, because if you do not hug your daughter, if you do not love her unconditionally, even when she hits an awkward age of puberty where the father's like, oh, I don't know, she has breasts now, so I don't know if I should hug her, it's kind of awkward. No, it's not awkward, you're her father. Amen. So what happens when you do not hug your daughter, your daughter will find love in other places and she will be abused, hurt, heartbroken. And like you were saying, Annie, when you have a situation where your pimp understands the psychology of a woman and really this is human nature is to be loved because God is love. It says in the Bible, he created us to love him. We are created to love one another especially right. him first and foremost. So when we're missing love, it's, it's a, it pulls you towards them. Okay. I want to please them. I want to be loved because deep down inside Annie, you wanted to be loved. Yes. And so you found yeah. Jesus on your trip to Italy and you, have yeah, Lord, I did. you go back to work and you're not feeling like you, you just, you, you, you're, you're, you, you're reading the Bible, but you're still doing this job. So what was the final straw? Obviously, besides the fines, not wanting to go. Oh, gosh. It, it it was so many years later. But in 2003, I literally like about a year before that. And then a couple years prior, I I got on painkillers because I had cancer. I came down with cancer in 1995 to 97. I had chemotherapy, radiation treatments for a year. My I lost all I lost my hair. I was going on calls with wigs and it was devastating. Like I literally, Anna, thought. I was being punished. I didn't know God's love, like the fullness of it, right? I didn't understand that God really did love me, but I felt like I had to do, do exactly what he said the minute he told me. I didn't realize the, the bigger picture of the grace and the mercy that mm -hmm. was in favor, the name Annie, right? And Anna, favor, was on my life. He had his hand on me this whole time. But what was really, really good is that when I got to my dark, dark part of my life where I just, I had to leave my, I left my second pimp. My brother showed up with a shotgun. Oh, it was, it was glorious. My brother, Chuck, he's crazy. He was like, Ch -ch. he told him, um, she's leaving today. And he just held the gun and my pimp just opened the door. He was scared. <laughs> so awesome it was so awesome and uh i got away and praise god for the second actually, amendment <laughs> right 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 load that sucker up baby fill it up with bullets so i ended up uh moving out i had a secret apartment that i stashed for okay i i got furniture i filled it up with my stuff and i moved into that apartment and it was right in the area that i met this guy that was helping me uh kind of like navigate the my feelings and how I was thinking. And he was a friend and I met him at, believe it or not, he was a trick. He was a, a buyer and he became my, one of my best friends. And he was like, you know what? You don't deserve this. You need to get away from him. I'll take care of you. Girl, he took me out of the lifestyle. 
took me to Hawaii. And I remember coming back. It was May 18th, the first time that I quit, uh, 1998. And he said, I love you and I want to marry you. So we got engaged. Now, I never married this guy because I'm married now. You guys can see. Yeah, and but her husband's lovely. I love Al, her husband. Yeah, Al was, uh, he was integral on getting me to get my mind in the right place. He taught me the automotive bu business industry, all that. And uh, something really bad happened with our uh, our business. And I, I got really triggered and devastated. I never had counseling. I never went to church. I never, I never was following God after this. I thought, well, maybe Al's my savior. I don't know. So I ended up um, getting back on drugs. It's a long story, but mm. really, really got twisted. And I started selling myself again when he was out of town. Yeah, because yeah. It's something that you mentioned at Mary Crowley's event where we where we it was it was a panel on human trafficking and uh, the prostitution rings, something that you mentioned one, by the way, porn is I want you to talk about. Well, mention porn really quick. Oh, porn is is a total gateway. It's a total gateway to prostitution and trafficking. Because men, what they do is, and people, like because men and women watch it, right? And the trans community, everybody watches it, right? So they are, their appetite is wet by watching those videos and they feel like I really want an experience now. Instead of touching myself or having sex with somebody with me, I want to actually call someone to hire them to do this. And so that's where we would come in as escorts and tricks would call and they would say, I want you to do that the same thing on the television, what, what they're doing. I want wow. you to do that. And so we that like because, least, because that, that that was our fantasy and that's what they wanted. And they probably told your pimp that's right. what I want her to do. Wow. Yeah. And at least half of my calls, there was pornography going on. There was major pornography going on. So that being said, I, I ended up um, getting back on drugs and I, I didn't know this at the time, but I had complex trauma. And so there's a difference between trauma and complex trauma. Trauma, you could say is it's real. It hurts. It, you know, it's a contusion on your, on your hand, you get your leg cut or whatever. And there's trauma, right? Emergency room trauma duties. Right. But then there's the brain trauma and the emotional trauma that was happening with me. Complex trauma is, is more insidious in deeper than regular trauma, emotional trauma, because complex trauma starts sometimes at a young age or when you start getting abused and you can't escape the situation. So it's, you're, you're constantly in danger. Your adrenal glands are constantly a hundred percent or more. And your, your fight, flight, or freeze is kicked in and fawning as well. So your cortisol levels are so high. They're through the roof to where you, you just, you, you're on the edge of triggering out and just having a seizure. Like you're, it's that intense. And so complex trauma causes all kinds of comorbidities. And what I mean by that is that uh, physical diseases, mental problems, high anxiety, severe triggering. Uh, just the work, breathing problems, you know, and you'll think you'll have a problem that you really don't because you've talked yourself into it because you're in this, this state of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So mm -hmm. I had that and didn't realize it. I was having anxiety attacks. So doing drugs stopped all that. It just made me feel level, made me feel like I was normal. Mm -hmm. And so when I finally overdosed and got off drugs, that's when I started getting symptoms of severe anxiety attacks. I mean, bad. They put me on Xanax. I turned him left to Jesus. I, I got off Xanax and, I, and Jesus told me, he said, I'm going to be your pill. I am your pill, Annie. Drink water and pray to me. And I'm telling you that he delivered me from all this stuff. Like God. this, like, dude, I, 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 I still walk out my salvation. Don't get me wrong in fear and trembling, but I know in the supernatural, I am whole healed and ready to help others. Right. And you, and I got that revelation when I, I had a dream about Jesus. And so I just, man, I'm telling you supernaturally, we are just like so blessed right now because you, today yeah. there's counseling, there's trauma counseling, there's everything for people that have complex trauma now yes. and therapies, but they didn't have anything like that back then when I first you, got out. Can you share your little dream about Jesus? I'm sure it's not little. I'm sure it's amazing. Okay. Um, well, I was in New York city at a bus stop and Jesus came to me and literally he was the most beautiful. Oh man. He didn't look human. He looked like an alien to me, like an, uh, the most beautiful human I'd ever seen. His eyes were huge. They were like, one was red, one was uh, red. Sorry. One was green. One was blue. And he 
he just walked up to me and I knew it was, I, I, Anna, I knew it was him. I just knew it. I had been praying to God, like, God, give me a dream. Give me a dream. I want to see Jesus. I don't want the Jesus that I see in pictures and movies. I want to see the real Jesus. I want to see what he looks like in heaven. Girl, when I saw him, it was like, I can't explain the feeling. You know, that wailing wall experience you had? Yeah. I literally felt like a love bomb hit me and I was in another realm. And he, and he came to me without his lips and started talking to me, telling me that I was beautiful, that I was chosen, that I was loved, that I was set apart. He was telling me I was his daughter. I was his princess. And then he said to me, like, before I woke up, I want you to go on the Las Vegas Strip and tell those women that I love them. Wow. That's simple. That, mm. That's what started Hookers for Jesus. And I woke up and I didn't remember the dream right away, but then I got in the shower and I literally passed out in the shower because I remembered the dream. And I was like, oh my gosh, the liquid love that filled me up. I was like high for about two, three weeks after that. Like I loved everything and everybody. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this flower. Oh my gosh, I love, oh, I love you. You're just so beautiful. I was meeting people and I was like, do you know Jesus loves you? And he just like went to town with my spirit and my soul. And just clean me out. And then he had me write down all the things I could remember that I did. Burn them with the match. Throw them outside. And like do all these different rituals like for my personal self. Like to yeah, make myself, it, it, I guess, feel better. Healing but it's not, it's not required. But I knew I had to do it for me. And so I, that's what started HFJ. Like literally the first outreach was lightly in 2004-ish. But 2005 was the official outreach. And that's what started our nonprofit. And literally, I just started passing out bags to women that needed help. And then I had nowhere to put them. So Destiny House was formed. And Destiny House is where ladies can dream, discover, develop into the God's perfect destiny that he has for them. It's a structured living. They Before they leave our program, they get a job. They go to school. They get the life skills that they were, you know, everything that they needed to learn that they didn't have before they started being sold by their traffickers. And not only that, they get the best trauma therapy and equine therapy, and we do artwork with them. And we just try to relate and, and work with each lady as a client to, and by the way, we don't do it. God does all of this. The healing process, we allow that space for it to happen. We don't force it. We let them come and go at their own pace with the healing. And then we, you know, we lovingly say, oh, you're ready now. You have wings. You can fly. And that's what dream house is about. Dream house is the part where they fly, where they can live more independently. It's not 24 seven with staff anymore. And it's just a very good supportive environment, you know, Monday through Friday and light, lightly on the weekends and they can work their job or, the, or go to their college and just, you know, live their life normally again. And yes. reintegrate into society, which is very difficult to do when you have trauma triggers 24-7. So if you don't get that part healed, and I'm speaking to you ladies out there and men out there that, and, and young kids out there that have not been healed from trauma, please, I implore you to just really seek God and get that those deep inner wounds healed because he is our healer. He is the lover of our soul and he desires to have a relationship with you. And see, that was the key for me. When I had a relationship with Jesus, trauma cannot defeat Jesus. No complex trauma. He is the answer. And I, and I want to say this and I declare this. I've said this before, but everyone's talking about psychotherapy, this trauma therapist, doctor, this, Hey, I'm not doubting anybody. Please help all of us. Please talk to all the, the people that need counseling. But the key factor for my personal healing and many girls that I, and, and clients we have, the Jesus factor. Jesus the, is the original trauma-informed care. He is the designer of that. And what trauma-informed care really is this, is this. It's love. Do everything in love. Let love be the law of your heart. And everything will flow after that. Right? So that's what we do. And if anyone's interested, they can go to hookersforjesus.net or pinkchair.com because I have a show called Pink Chair. And also, we love to sit and talk with women that need help.
And what happens is when we sit and talk with them, it's just like sitting in this chair here. You sit in your chair, a change happens in their heart. And then there, that conversation happens. And all of a sudden they want to get out of their situation with their traffickers. They want to get the healing that they need so they can live in the perfect destiny that God has already designed for them. So that's what we do. And I am married now to a man named Oz Fox and you met him. Yeah. And you've <laughs> been married for how long? For how long? 13 years, 13 years now uh, about. Yeah. And so and he's, he's actually, it's 12 officially next year will be 13. Yeah. He's in a band called Striper. Uh, look it up. It's a famous Christian metal, heavy metal band that got famous on MTV that crossed over back in the day. And he is such a great support and a love of my life. I, I just love him. And he's, he doesn't mind me talking about my past. He loves the work we do. He knows all the clients we work with and frequently visits us at the destiny house property in our offices. So he's great. a great wow. guy. Well, Annie, you are an incredible woman. I mean, this woman took the call that Jesus spoke into her life in a dream. And she literally hit the streets of Las Vegas. She goes on the, the strips where these prostitutes are standing out and selling their bodies. She comes up and speaks to them, brings them in, talks them about, um, you know, what they've been through. They, she walks them through, Hey, I used to be exactly where you were. And here's what freed me. It's Jesus Christ. And she would take him into the destiny house and she's building now a, another home called dream house. Okay. This is her website, which I have up here. Hookers for Jesus. You guys, we have to support this. By the way, I love how you, um, you, you said hook, hope, heal, help. You see with the religious folks that are triggered when they say hookers for Jesus, that's, that's, that's blasphemy. <laughs> well, actually, what did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, catch the fish right? Catch the mm -hmm. fish. You use a hook to catch the fish. So they're literally hooking in people for Jesus. The women, the men and women that are on the streets that are forgotten, that feel yeah. broken, that feel that their life has no meaning. The ones who were neglected when they were children, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. Maybe they're in love with money. Maybe now they're stuck in a situation where they don't know how to get out, which is what Annie experienced as well. You cannot judge a man. Only God judges the heart. But we That's can right. with the love of God, with the destiny that the Lord has planned for them. It is not over. The enemy makes you think it's done. You, you're Annie, your whole mm. life, you've done this and this is who you are. No, that is who you were. You are a new person now. You are a new creation now. Now you, you operate in the love of Christ going to these women on the street. I mean, you guys, we have to, I, I want to support this so much. I'm donating. Amen. Which is a lot of information. Thank you, about Anna. You're welcome. There's a lot of information here about sex trafficking. This is her pink chair podcast that we, we actually just filmed it right before this. So just an amazing. And it's a TV story. show too. It is yeah. A TV we're on show. television too. <laughs> and so we're also, we're also survivor led. And I just want to implore you because Anna, you already know this survivor led initiatives rarely get the support that it, there's a lot of agencies now for trafficking, which is awesome, but the survivors get left behind. We don't get supported as much. We don't know why this is happening, Ooh. but I do know this is that God loves the underdog. And so, you know, I, I thank you for having us on today. I, you bless my heart, Anna. I, the Holy Spirit's with you. And thank you for what you're doing to bring attention to this and your heart for people that are lost because it's beautiful. And mm. I love what you do. Gathering bride. It's just beautiful. Praise God. Well, we give him all the glory. It's by his grace. And get her book, Fallon or Fallen. Where can they find your book, Annie? Oh, they can go to our website. There's a link. And then also they can just go to Amazon and get it. And all, it's also an audio. I have an audio here. Don't go to Amazon. Go to her website. Yeah. Go to her website. Yeah. You go on Amazon. So, she gets a little piece. Go get it from her. I, I mean, if at anything, because I, I haven't received one dollar yet from the book. <laughs> It's okay. Well, you know what? Because I tried to buy it from you. Listen, I, I came up and I said, Annie, I want to buy your book. She I said, know. Oh, Holy Spirit telling me. Nope. I said, Annie, I want to pay. Ah, that's why we're sending a donation. In. She's such I a know. giver. She's Thank such a you. beautiful yeah. heart. Thank Just you. Just love you. You and adore too. you. So good to have you here. If you guys, if people Thank want you. to reach you, Annie, where do they find you? Yeah, they can reach us at uh, pinkchair.com. 
Real simple, just pinkchair.com or hookersforjesus.net. And any social media, Twitter is the same thing. You can go to Annie Lobert. You can go to Hookers for Jesus and Pink Chair. I think it's Annie's Pink Chair on, on Twitter. But if you just look, if you put my name in, Annie Lobert, you'll find me all over social media. You can't miss it. And especially Hookers for Jesus. Hookers for Jesus is going to always be our outreach forever. You know, Pink Chair, we're kind of transitioning into that main name, which is going to be happening in January. But I'm really excited about that. So just pray for us and uh, come hang out with us. Come say hi and we'll reach right back out to you if you need any help and if you need any resources or connections in your, your community for trafficking. Yes, if you are watching this program and you are stuck in this lifestyle and you don't know how to get out because we're on YouTube, we're on Twitter right now, we're on Facebook, reach out to Annie. She will give you all the resources you need. You can stay at her house at, at the Destiny Home for 12 months. Mm -hmm. And you guys, we have to support this. Like she said before, there's not many, you know, funding coming in. And this is unbelievable. She's been doing this since 2010, a lot of it on her own dime. So it's time to support these women who are hooking people in for Jesus. Annie, we love you. Thank you for being here. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye, guys.